Okay, welcome back. Good to see you. Um, if you're new here, uh, my name's Joel. I'm one of the leaders here in the church. And uh, every week we have teaching from the Bible. And at the moment we're going through a book in the Bible called Nehemiah. And so this series is called Transforming for Good. And uh, we've got to chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 7 to verse 23 at the end of the chapter. And then we will get to work. So let me just read this to you. When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at the time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me. None of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. Okay, February. February is uh, the month, I was told years ago by a pastor, February is the month when pastors are busiest. It's the month when people most need pastoring. It's the month when people turn to depression and turn to discouragement. It's the, the dreariest, weariest month of the year. It's, it's winter, but it's not Christmas. It's like, it's not New Year either. We've passed all the kind of things that make, Christ, make winter uh, exciting. Uh, we've got so far with our New Year's resolutions and no further. And uh, we are just longing for the spring. I guess this year especially it feels like that with the weather. The rains have been relentless. Uh, each of us individually, I guess, has felt the impact of that. And you look at the media and realize that the nation is feeling the impact of it. The, the headlines range from faintly miserable to catastrophic uh, with all kinds of bits in between. It's, it's, a, it's a tough, dreary season. I, I actually checked recently this week to say, is it actually the season of most suicides? Turns out it's not. The month that's busiest for suicides is actually June. Um, I think the reason for that is probably that it takes a little bit of energy to commit suicide. <laughs> uh, you have to actually, you know, sort of get yourself psyched up for it, you know, whereas in the winter, in February, we can't even do that. It's just a dreary season. And I'm using that as an illustration of a general principle in that the dark seasons of life can take a lot out of us. 
they can leave us wondering if there's light at the end of the tunnel. They can make us wonder if we've taken a wrong turning. They can make us want to quit. And that's exactly what we see in this part of this story. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that the story began with some excitement. There was this electric moment where Nehemiah, the leader, managed to uh, score the money for a glorious urban project, which was completely against expectations. He got money from the guy who was most against Jerusalem on the planet to build Jerusalem. It was a miracle. And then he, he showed up in Jerusalem, gathered all the, the, the top people and said, right, we're going to build the city. And they all joined in. They all felt it was exciting. There was this new adrenaline rush that just pulsed through the whole city and they got to work. And it was, it was magical. But they've hit a definite wall here. They, they've hit a serious season of discouragement. You, you read there in, in verse 10, in Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves we'll not be able to rebuild the wall. There's too much rubble. Maybe you can relate to that feeling in all kinds of ways in your own life. The, the challenges are too big. There's too much rubble. There's too much rubbish, there's too much junk, there's too much discouragement, there's too many reasons to not be cheerful. There's too many disappointments, there's too many agonies. And it, it, can, it can mean that we have the strength and the energy gradually sapped or, or even quickly sapped away from us. And then you, you realize when you read this, it goes further. It's not just that he's discouraged by the, the setback and the disappointment, but, but there's also this nasty element of opposition. And it's, it's, it's got worse. If you were here last week, you'll know that the opposition started with tauntings, but here it's turned to threats. They're starting to brandish weapons. They're showing up and saying, let's just, let's just uh, help, let them see a few blades, and they'll, they'll quit. They'll, they'll quit when they see us. They'll, they'll cause confusion. They'll, they'll, it will cause disruption if we turn up ready to fight them in Jerusalem. And that's, that's a, another element. That's like a, it's like a bullying, intimidating kind of terrorism, frankly. Fear has crept in as well as discouragement. This is a recipe for disaster. The work is surely not going to go further. I, I guess... I was thinking, how can I relate this to us? I think, I think the reality is that as, as people of all backgrounds, all different experiences of life, we know what it is to go into a project, an adventure, a commitment, with, with excitement, with like, tails wagging, as it were, and, and then hit the first moment of difficulty, the first hurdle, the first diff and then kind of just get through the hurdle and think, wow, I can't believe I got through that. I think I'm still on course. It was difficult. I'm a bit drained, but I'm still going. I'm still going. And then there's another hurdle. Then there's another disappointment. Another, and, and eventually it wears you down. And you think, am I, it, am I in the right place? Is this even the right thing to be doing? Many people <laughs> hit this when they've been Christians for a while. The first few weeks or months of, of being a Christian can be the most elated. You, you kind of feel you, you, you enjoying this honeymoon season of, 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 of just kind of, there's, there's a joy, there's a wonder, your sins are forgiven, you've got a sense of purpose, destiny, meaning in your life. There's a God who knows you, always knew you, even when you didn't know him, even when you hated him, he cared about you. You're blown away and you're enjoying this kind of season of beginnings. But, but maybe to your surprise, eventually you hit this kind of wall of difficulty where it's just difficult to carry on. You feel a sense of, oh, I'm not feeling quite the same energy as I was feeling. And maybe coupled with that, there's some opposition that's creeping in. There's some people that are speaking down to you, who, who are mocking you even, because of your stand. It's hard, especially if it's people that are close, isn't it? It's interesting, it actually says when you, you get down to uh, verse 12, this isn't on the PowerPoint, but it says, at this time, the Jews who live near them came from all directions and said to us 10 times, you must return to us. Come back to us. We hate the fact that you've gone off to build this wall, that you're on God's mission. We hate it. 
What are you doing? Come back to us. We want life as it was. When you become a Christian, one of the toughest things that can happen is when people that are close to you, maybe it's a, a close friend or a colleague or maybe even a, a member of your family, maybe even a spouse, turns on you. And, and they feel rejected, they feel spurned by your decision, they feel you've got into something they're not into, and it, it, it creates a reaction which makes you feel like you've done something wrong. I remember when uh, some friends of mine came to see me, sat me down, when I was, I guess I was about 17, and just said, look, we're just tired of this Christian thing. I, I didn't, I was just, when they left, I was in tears. I didn't know what, I was just, I don't know what I've done wrong. I'm just trying to follow God. And, and if, you're, if you're sensitive to it, you may even start to think you've taken a wrong turn. Because you've made conflict. You, you've, you've made a decision that's brought conflict into some relationships that used to be harmonious. It was fine until you brought this Jesus thing into the equation. Now it's like World War Three. It's like, well, maybe, maybe I just, maybe this isn't worth it. Do you know the feeling, some of you? This is horrible, and and, and you, you gotta, you gotta understand stories like Nehemiah at times like this. You gotta understand a very important principle of God's word and God's world that conflict is a necessary part of standing for truth. <coughs> it's, it's not a welcome part. It's especially not welcome if you're English. If you're English like me, you, you, we have a, an addiction to decency and, and pleasantness. We, we hate to cause a fuss. We hate it. We can't think of anything worse, surely, than causing a fuss. We're terrified of it. I, I tell you, that is a bit of an English thing. It's probably true across humanity, but if you've traveled, I've had the privilege of traveling a bit. I've noticed, I've been around some other cultures in the world, they don't seem to worry about causing a fuss as much as we do. I say we, you know, if you're not English, we apologize. I really apologize, in fact. I'm really sorry. I don't mean they cause a fuss. I don't, it's just, it's in the blood. It's just this weird kind of, oh, I'm sorry. To go. And, and I read this book and I realize all God's servants all God's real servants who went for it, who went for it, yeah, caused a fuss. The point is, if you follow Jesus, you're following someone who caused a fuss. Everywhere he went. <coughs> Jesus, if you follow Jesus Christ, he, 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 said, he said to his disciples, don't think I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. I've come to turn a, a, a child from parents and parents from... And, and I read this book, I think, well, Nehemiah, it must have been so tempting at this point to think, yeah, maybe, maybe I was wrong about the whole idea. Maybe the whole point is, is that I should just, maybe, that's, maybe I've just come too far. I'm saying this to you because I know this is the precise thing some of you are wandering through at the moment. And you've even had this very recently. Some of you have had people sit you down and, and, and you love them. You're not, you're not trying to make hassle. For some of you, it's not so much that. It's, it's that you're trying to do something for God and you're getting arrows from people who you don't expect, even sometimes from friends. People who you say, you know, you've got an ambition to keep pure in your relationships. You don't want to sleep with your girlfriend. I remember that one. That was, that was, oh, I just, I just the comments. You, you're waiting for a Christian husband or wife. You don't, you don't want to get married to the wrong person. You just, oh, I'm going st to stay faithful. I know that if I'm supposed to get married, God will bring someone to me who's, who's, who's going to be my Christian partner. And you're waiting, and you're, you're holding on, and it's tough anyway. And then someone says, what are you doing? Be real. Maybe you're raising kids to, to, to know God and you're teaching them the Bible and you're talking to them about Jesus and trying to explain God to them and trying to and, and sometimes people will come to you and aggressively attack you for it. How can you do that? You're indoctrinating them and you should let them be free and make their own minds up. You think, well, I'm kind of trying to make them free. I just know that freedom is in God. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't. And you feel this tip. I'm, I'm, I don't want the conflict. I don't want the conflict. Let me tell you, to follow God 
faithfully will often involve conflict. I'm not saying we look for conflict, but it will involve it very often. And, and we mustn't assume that means we've stepped out of the will of God. It might mean that, but it isn't to be assumed. I, I love the way that Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians. He's talking to the church in Corinth. He says, I'm in Ephesus. I'm preaching away. God's doing an amazing thing here in Ephesus. It's all breaking out. Amazing season of, of breakthrough. And he puts it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He says this, a, a, a door has opened. and The door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. <laughs> when I read that verse, I'm a bit like, well, that's not how I'd put it. <laughs> I'll put it like this. A wide door for effective work had looked like it was open for me. But there are many adversaries. <laughs> that's the way I think I'd write it. And Paul's thinking, oh, yeah, I think it's a good door. There's some adversaries. But I think it's a good door. But he's saying, oh, that's part of the course. Bit of opposition. I'm afraid that's part of it. I'm trying to help you. This is a part of following our Savior. So, so how's he going to handle it? I mean, it's a big deal he's got to handle here. You understand that the, the sorrow can break into the heart. The grief and the pain can, 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 can really creep in to people's situations here. So, so how's he going to deal with it? Well, let's look at these. I'm going to give you three quick ways that Nehemiah brilliantly handles this, and then we'll, we'll uh, get ready to respond with worship. But there's three things here. The first of them is that he, he prays. Okay, you see that in verse 9? We pray to our God to set a guard, sorry, and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. So first of all, we pray. Classic Nehemiah, remember? When he first heard the news about what happened back in Jerusalem, he started to pray. This guy is a prayer. He puts that first always. He, he is a praying man. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, he reorganizes. Now that, that's perhaps more of a surprise to us, but this is really important. It's worth some attention. He prays and he reorganizes. Let's read verse 9 again. We pray to our God and we set a guard. I want you to see that those things are not mutually exclusive. I want you to see that being spiritual and calling upon the Lord doesn't exclude being practical and setting up a guard. In fact, there's no such division in this verse between the spiritual thing and the non-spiritual thing. We often do this. We often dichotomize. You know what I mean by that? We, we put at one end spiritual at the other end, practical. We put at this end, you know, angels and harps and wings and halos and this kind of stuff. And at this end, tractors and blue tack and, and <laughs> things like that, thermometers and pigeons and this kind of end up here. And, and, you know, it's not really any kind of mixture, so we just, you know, we live in two different planes. But, but that's not biblical at all. Not at all. And true disciples of Jesus, true worshippers of God, will know that you worship God in the practicalities. And you can be very spiritual in setting up a guard. It's good to do that. It's good to pray. It's good to plan. It's good to do both. To pray with plans and to plan prayerfully. These things are joined. They're joined well. Nehemiah gets it. It's like I think it was Oliver Cromwell said. Put your trust in God and keep your powder dry. He was talking about gunpowder. It's a time when, you know, it's, it's in a military situation, it's like, yeah, we, we've got to pray, we've got to trust God, but we've got to also prepare the troops, get things ready. And Nehemiah's getting practical in this situation. And, and this is what's useful for us here. He's prepared to make all kinds of changes and organized uh, uh, alterations in the midst of very clear commitment to one goal. It's vital that we get this because... I'm talking to you about quitting and not quitting. And, and we can sometimes think that so it's enough to simply say, never give up. That was you know, the great slogan of Winston Churchill in, in, in the war, never give up. And it was kind of everyone's favorite catchphrase and that kind of defiant attitude, never give up. I, I read a book a few years ago by a business guy called Seth Godin called The Dip. And uh, it's a good book. He, he says, actually, the... the the advice, never give up, is patchy at best. It's not that wise to say, never give up. Because frankly, you're going to have to give up on some things. The wisdom, the trick, is to know what to give up on. To know what it is that you are never going to negotiate, and then to be prepared to be flexible on everything else. This is so important for us as individuals, it's important in organizations, it's important if you're in any kind of leadership or management situation like Nehemiah is. 
in your job, in your family. It's important in church life. We find this as leaders in this church. We have to be really good at this. We have to know what are the things that we never give up on and what are the things that we will give up on tomorrow if we need to. Change all the time. You've got to be wise. Nehemiah, if you scratched him, you knew. Anywhere you scratched it was like, we're building a wall. That, that's never going to change. That's never, I am building a wall. You cut him, he bleeds wall building. That's it. But he was prepared to be flexible on everything else. The deadline, the style in which the building takes place, where people stay overnight, what they have to wear on them. He's changing things all the time. Are we going to use troops? Are we going to not use troops? I don't know. We'll have to see. What's the deadline? Are we going to finish by then? Are we going to finish by then? I don't know. We'll have to see. What are we going to do if there's opposition? I don't know. We'll have to see. Do you know anything? Yes. We're going to build a wall. In, in any walk of life, especially in leadership, you've got to be wise about what you see as a non-negotiable. What hill you're going to die on? What's the thing that's going to be done? And what we sometimes do as leaders in churches, especially as we fall into the trap of, of making too many things non-negotiable or too few things non-negotiable. Or we simply make the wrong things non-negotiable. <laughs> you go to churches that are absolutely fundamentalist about pews and stained glass windows. But they're very open about whether Jesus rose from the dead or not. Oh, we could talk about that. Uh, that's very open to negotiation. Uh, maybe he rose in some kind of strange spiritual sense. Yeah, maybe in some vague, ethereal, Kantian sense, Jesus is alive from the dead. We, oh, oh, it's all open to speculation. It's all very... But don't you dare touch the pews! <laughs> wrong thing to negotiate on. Wrong thing to hold fast to. And what we need is churches that are prepared to be flexible about absolutely everything except this book. You come to us and say, well, well, can we negotiate? Is this really what God said? We've heard of this other guy who started the story saying, did God really say that? And uh, we know what happens to him. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to negotiate on what God said. But we will negotiate. We will, we will change everything from the carpets to the budgets to the staff to the plans for the year. To we will change stuff because God will always be doing new things. We, we, we are prepared to, to open our door to, to all kinds of changes because we think, no, 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 the main thing has got to remain the main thing. Do you understand? This is so important. We can be a bit tempted to overdo it in terms of what's non-negotiable. Nehemiah is wise enough to be flexible. You would be wise to follow his example in this. So that's one thing he does. The second thing he does is he, well, no, that was the second thing. The third thing he does is he, he speaks to the people. So he prays, he reorganizes and he addresses the people. He speaks to them. How does he speak to them? I like this. Verse 14. I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers and your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Remember the Lord. And, and he's also saying remember to fight. So I'm going to just break this down. One of the things he's telling them to do is, he says, first of all, remember to fight. Let's deal with that first. It's worth, it's worth pausing on that because we, we can miss the fact that we're called to a battle. Again, this is, a, this is a naivety that Christians are so often guilty of. We, we are happy with the idea that, that, that God's grace carries us along through life. And we are safe <laughs> from accusation and condemnation and we're forgiven our sins and we have a future all because of God's mercy. And these things are so comforting to us. What we can sometimes do is remain only in that place of gentle comfort, forgetting that grace also calls us to, to be strong. Paul says to Timothy, be strong in the grace of God. He says to the Ephesians, stand in the evil day having done all stand which suggests to me that there is this this militancy there's this battle there's this fight that is absolutely at the root at the heart of of, of following Christ there's this willingness to to take up arms against the challenges we face spiritually speaking you know one of the, the, the best verses to explain the Christian life is in Philippians chapter 2, a couple of verses, where, where, where Paul says to the church there, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for, 
It is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now listen, this is really important. This, okay, hear me. Because it's teaching that goes around the world that misses this. And it's wrong teaching. It's been going around for a while. And sometimes it's been called different things. Sometimes it's been called Keswick teaching from, from about 100 years ago or more. Th- there's this idea that basically a Christian is a kind of suit of clothes that Jesus wears. That's how one preacher put it. I remember my dad telling me this, a preacher he heard. A good preacher and a good guy. But he got this slightly wrong, I think. A Christian is a suit of clothes that Jesus wears. It sounds lovely. You know, you're just a suit of clothes. You're just passive. You're just passively just letting Jesus just control you. And so you like just passively getting on with lying down on your sofa. And it's like, oh, it seems like Jesus is getting up. Oh, it looks like Jesus is, oh, 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 Jesus is brushing his teeth. So it's kind of weird sort of passivity that, that, that you can see why people get there. Because look at the second part of this. God works in you. You can see where they get that from, can't you? But look at what Paul says. What Paul builds from that. That clear statement is, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you. Because God is at work in you, roll your sleeves up. Because God is at work in you, fight, be strong, be tough. Do all necessary to fight against sin. Be aggressive in it. Stand in his strength, in his grace, but stand. One preacher... Martin Lloyd-Jones had a young man come to see him saying, I'm struggling so much with a, with a habit. I, I don't know what it was. He had a habitual problem in his life. He came to him and said, I'm so deep. I'm, just, I'm trying to fight this. And Martin Lloyd-Jones sat down with his Bible and talked him through the truth of who he was in Christ. Gave him a new sense of identity, new sense of who he was, all that God had done for him in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He sent him on his way rejoicing, knowing... <laughs> I'm not who I thought I was. I'm free. I don't have to be under the control of this temptation. I'm so pleased. But of course, a month later, he knocks on Lloyd Jones's door. Says, that didn't work. I was elated for a while, but the, the, the joy didn't last, and I find that I'm still just so weak. And Martin Lloyd Jones said to him, "Did I not tell you also that you have to fight?" Some of you, you need to hear this. We sing and dance and clap and shout and preach about grace all the time. Don't let grace be misunderstood. Don't let grace be the reason that you don't fight, that you don't stand ground, you don't hold fast. Hold fast to him, hold fast to grace, hold fast to strength, but hold fast. Do you hear what I'm saying? Nehemiah's saying, fight, remember to fight. He said, fight, what did you expect? You, you're not, it's not a level plane, it's not... It's, there's an enemy who hates you. When you became a Christian, you made an enemy. And he's he's busy enemy. He works 24-7. It says in Revelation, he works day and night to accuse the brothers. He will attack you. He will entice you. He will distract you. He will discourage you. He will depress you. And you'll think, what's happening to me? I thought Christianity would give me joy. What's going on? Life is going on. That's what's going on. The fight. It's called a fight. Fight the good fight. Be at war. Be strong in the grace of God. So Nehemiah is calling them to that kind of militancy. There's another option, of course. We could just yield to self-pity. We could just say, well, it's just, it's just difficult. I tried it. It was really hard to follow Jesus. I gave it my best shot. That's what we could do. And trust me, if there's anyone in the world who, who could have investigated whether self-pity works, it's me. I've, I've examined self-pity for weeks at a time. If anyone has ever found the way through, it would be me. But I've, I've never found it because it's a cul-de-sac. Some of you, you're stuck there. You've been stuck there for a while maybe a few months, and you're saying, that's just hard. No one gets it. No one sees how hard my Christian life is. No one seems to care. No one seems to understand. You're playing that tape over and over, over and over, over and over. I tell you, it's fruitless. It will not get you anywhere. It's a dead end. 
there's a better place to be. I, I, I'm struck when I read this. this the, the verse 10, you know that verse. It says, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. You know, in, in the Hebrew, that's written in verse. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a poem probably to be sung. They were singing that. Imagine the worship times. <laughs> that's what they were singing. You turn up to church, it's like, that's what's the first time we're going to do? And, and Becky gets out and Sam's there, the, and every Sam's there, and the drums start, and it's uh, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. <laughs> By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. <laughs> and and you, you, hear, yeah. and you, you, you know what I mean. You play the tape again and again, again and again. This is, this is, this is the thing. It's not just about, I mean, the enemy gets dark. The, the Bible says, Ephesians 6, he, he fires darts at you. Right? That's his thing. He's just always fiery darts, fiery darts. Ancient world, the, they would send arrows with, with, with covered in fuel so they could be on fire when they landed. You have to put your shield out there. The Bible says, hold out the shield of faith. It's darts that don't get in, but, but you know the darts got in when you're singing it. <laughs> and it's the tape that plays in your head. It's the song you can't get out of your head. I knew we weren't going to be able to make it anyway. I thought this was a bad idea in the first place. You know, these are the songs that we, we just live in. And it's, it's a place we can stay if we want to. You can sing those songs if you want but nothing good will come of it. I, I know it's difficult. I know I could be glib now. Just, just grow up, stop it, cut it out. What's wrong with you? Is that what made Britain great? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that what you're expecting from me? You know, you're just going to tell me, stiff up a lip, just come cut it out. And maybe that's what, that's what, you're worried about. You think, well, I just, yeah, but there's no other. I just, I, I don't know how to get, I don't know how to snap out of it. Well, Nehemiah says, remember to fight. But listen, he also <laughs> says, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Awesome. You know that word we use about pudding? Awesome. You know, the, the Hebrew word means terrible. He is great and terrible. I don't use the word great very I deliberately don't use it very often. I try, if I catch myself writing it in a letter, I delete it. I, seriously, I do not use it that often. I use it about people who serve in this church, but about, about almost nothing else. Because there's certain words that should be reserved, like awesome, for example. God is great and terrible and he says he will fight for us I know you're not strong enough to fight I know and neither am I to be honest I'm not but I remember the Lord and I remember him and, and if Nehemiah could find hope how much more can you and I this man, Nehemiah, he, he knows enough about the Lord. How, how, I mean, how do we even wind up in Jerusalem? How could we even be here? It's a miracle that we got the money to build the walls, to get the material, to build the timber, to get the... It's, all, it's just impossible. God did a miracle. He got me away. It is incredible that we're here. Look at what God's done. He remembers the Lord in that sense. I tell you, you remember the Lord surely in a greater sense, though. What does it mean for you and I to remember the Lord? When the enemy wants to steal your hope. That's what he is. Jesus said he's a liar and a thief. He wants to steal your hope. And he'll do it. He'll succeed if you let him. But Jesus, Jesus is great and terrible. You want an example? Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, the very end of the Bible. This is when his servant John, his closest friend in fact, was on uh, exile in Patmos, this island, middle of nowhere. Been tortured, beaten up, left for dead on this island in exile, Jesus turns up and speaks to him. It says this, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, 
clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And this is my favorite bit. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death in Hades. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. This changes everything. It changes everything. It changes the horizon. It changes the future for you. Because, listen, this, what does it mean? If Jesus is risen from the dead, it means that the worst enemy you will ever face has already been defeated. And every enemy that is a lesser one is included. The worst enemy you will face is death. Jesus has already taken him out. Jesus defeated him at the cross, proving it through his resurrection. If it's true that Jesus rose from the dead, and by the way, if it isn't, then what are we doing here? What a waste of time. But if it's true that he rose, and indeed it is true that he rose, if it's true, it changed everything it changes everything it changed everything for whoever you are if you've been walking with Jesus for years or all months and struggled and hit the wall and been discouraged thought this isn't going to change this situation isn't going to change I'm stuck in this situation who says you're stuck in any situation he couldn't be stuck in a cave dead cold in a tomb who says the universe is a locked up, predictable, <sighs> random process of circumstances that we have no power over? Who says? Jesus is risen from the dead. He's defeated death. There's hope. There's destiny. There's future. Even, even in the face of the cross. Even in the face of the worst possible seeming defeat. Jesus Jesus is victorious. Jesus has won. Jesus has conquered his enemies, and that changes everything for you and me. It gives us a sense of perspective that changes everything. It, it means that we can even understand the grief and the sorrow that we go through from a different angle. It's like the way that Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, talking about the suffering and the difficulty of being, a, being an apostle in Ephesus. Listen, the man was beaten up. The man was accused of things. The man had crowds of tens of thousands turning up for a riot against him. He was put in prison. This man suffered in all kinds of ways. Over years, following Jesus, he struggled, he suffered, he was tired so many times. He says this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says this, We don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we've set our hope that he will deliver us again. I don't care who you are, you can't live without hope. You, you can't. It's, it's against your humanity. It's, it's, like, it's like trying to breathe underwater. You cannot live without hope. Humans were built for hope, for destiny, for future, for purpose, for knowing there's a hope. There's a reason for this difficult trial I'm in. There's a plan. There's a God who hasn't forgotten me. There's a fight that I'm destined to win. I've not been... Uh, left on my own there's not a receiver off the hook in heaven it's not like god has has made some error there's a hope the resurrection gives us such a basis for it let me finish by just 
thinking of a story that I uh, was reminded of this week. In, in, in southern France, there's a, there's a fortress called Aigues Mort, you know, a, a town, a very old medieval town. And if you go there, you can see where, for a long time, some uh, young girls were kept in prison. A young girl, Marie Durand, was kept there for 35 years, imprisoned at the age of 14. Marriageable age in that culture. She could have got married, she could have had a future in their culture. But she was asked to recant her position on, on, on following Jesus Christ. She wanted to hold true to, to a Huguenot belief that she got, a Protestant Christian belief. They said, if you, just, uh, if you say j'abjure, if you, if you recant, you're free. You just go, walk out the door. As soon as you say one word, just walk out the door. She stayed there for 35 years. If you go there today, you can see this. I went there years ago. You see this carved on the wall. It's the French word, resister. You can guess what it means. The Bible says, resist the devil. He will flee. He will flee. You may have to resist him for a long time. You may be tempted to think, I've been forgotten. I'm languishing, giving the best years of my life. I'm, I'm getting old. I'm, I'm wrinkling. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my life in a dungeon. What is the point of this? You cannot do that if you don't have hope. But because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I can be confident. We can know. There's, there's no way we lose. We have hope. We have, we have destiny because of Jesus Christ. 